God bless you. This is Pastor Tyrone Hillman Jr. of Shekinah Christian Fellowship, and it's my privilege to present to you today's message. Today's message is a continuation of our theme this year, which is simply now faith, and it comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. But we're going to continue to focus on Hebrews chapter 6, specifically on verses 9 through 12, with a message that is simply titled, A Faith That Hopes. Come on, let's go into that message and be blessed. God bless you. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. Won't be before you long. That's the happiest time I've been all I said that. Some of you glee and jump. Hallelujah. I won't be before you long, but I can speak to him. Hallelujah. That was a disclaimer. I do have somewhere to be tomorrow, so I got here. So at some point we're going to have to. <laughs> I'm just playing, y'all. Goodness gracious. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 uh, through 12. 9 through 12. Hallelujah. And this is a continuation uh, from the passages of Scripture that we explored on last week. I want to encourage those of you all that need copies of the messages to continue to do so and just allow those things to play throughout the day, play throughout the week. Man, play it for that booger bear while he's sleeping. Just put it on. Just let it stay on repeat over and over again. It might get in his spirit. Do some work. Yeah, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hebrews 6, 9 through 12, and it says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have shown toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope to the end. That ye be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit Promises. I'm going to read verses 11 and 12 again. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence, the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And the theme this year has been now faith, and it comes from Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 3. Uh, but on today, uh, for the text that we have selected and chosen, we're going to emphasize a faith that hopes. A faith that hopes. A faith that hopes. A faith that hopes. So in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, it says, Now faith is uh, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, a good witness. And then through faith we understand that the worlds were framed, by the word of God, so that the things which were made were not made of things uh, which do appear. So when we consider the theme for this year, uh, it's rooted in God's shared collective desire um, that he has for each and every one of us uh, to, to be developed uh, so that we can trust him in everyday moments. Uh, this is not just a faith um, that's trusting God to get you out of prison. That's a faith that only seeks to exercise itself when it's in trouble. The type of faith that you and I are growing and building is an everyday faith. The faith that's needed for us to work on our jobs. The faith that's needed for us to take care of our families. The faith that's needed to love our enemies. The faith that's needed to walk by faith. The faith that's needed to, to reach out and extend ourselves in sacrifice and service to others. We're talking about the faith that meets the mundaneness of life. The faith, the type of faith we're talking about is the stuff you don't get to write in a book that's interesting to the world. 
We're talking about the monotony of life and exercising faith in that. You hear Lady Hillman talking about it? We're talking about exercising the faith to do dishes without slamming cabinets. We're talking about the type of faith to discipline your children without being filled with anger, wrath, or provoking them to wrath. We're talking about the simple faith just to submit yourself on your job. When they give you feedback to say thank you. Faith. We ain't just talking about the faith necessarily to defeat cancer or speak to mountains because here's the thing. The same faith that's needed to defeat and overcome those things is the same faith that God wants us to exercise every single day. Hallelujah. Every single day. And so when God steps into our life, he teaches us how to make everything a spiritual encounter with him. He teaches us how, how to bring him not only into the bedroom, but into the boardroom. This is why God will not allow us, hallelujah, to have areas of our life that are secluded, separated, and isolated from his presence. Whatsoever you do, or in word or in deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Many of us, what God has said, I'm calling you out of the closet and I'm sending you into a global faith, a universal faith. What do I mean by that? Not just a faith that only exercises itself within the confines of the worship facility. We're talking about a faith that meets you at the grocery store so that you'll talk to the cashier right. That kind of faith. We're talking about a faith that won't look down upon those that are in positions of service when you seemingly are in a position of authority. That kind of faith. We're talking about a faith that's willing to love folk that can't do nothing for you. Faith. A faith that is willing to say it's possible that as I'm giving to a homeless person, I might be entertaining an angel. That kind of faith. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A faith that's willing to restore those that have fallen in iniquity, that have fallen in sin, fallen in trial and tribulation, not because you're high and mighty, because you know that you got to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest you be tempted by the same spirit also. That kind of faith. And so we have to ensure then that faith can't just be this abstract sense of belief can't just be the type of stuff that we see the entertainers embrace. I want to thank God. When in your bootios, I mean in your videos, all you do is glorify. I'm sorry, y'all. I got young people here. All it does is glorify that which dishonors God. How you going to have a cross encrusted with diamonds cussing me out? That's offensive to me. You can't wear a symbol, a sacred symbol that's tied to my to the celebration of my salvation and it be encrusted in diamonds and you cuss me out in the soul. It, it, it just don't it just don't keep. It just don't keep right here. I'm just saying. Hallelujah. You, you can't get up and thank God. You can't just think because you wrote a song about having faith and had, believing in God, that one song, and then all the other ones is talking about how you destroyed our communities with selling drugs and how you destroyed families by bringing women into prostitution. I, you, that just don't keep with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we, we then... We then got to embrace a type of faith that's not just about being able to define what denomination or what doctrinal affiliation you tend to hold to. No, we want a faith that can be defined by what we do. So when we say we love Jesus, we ought to be able to trace it to the very clear evidence that's in our life. How do we know you love Jesus? Hallelujah. And many times when God asks questions, he's not asking for a response. He's actually looking for evidence. Hallelujah. What's the evidence that you're a believer? If you couldn't walk around with the big moose Bible, y'all know moose Bible, that's the one picking up and choke a moose. Hallelujah. If you couldn't walk around with that, what would be the evidence that you're a believer? Let me help you. Sometimes the evidence is the fact you don't gossip. I didn't discount it 20% of the congregation. Hallelujah, because you love some juicy gossip under the guise of, I need you to pray. 
Now, you know the person you're talking to don't have a prayer life. You know they don't fast. You know they only talk to God on Sunday. But now you want to talk to them and present it to them for prayer. Lord Jesus, help us, Father. Thank you, Father. So on um, today, we want to talk about, I didn't got all off. Well, how much time I got? A faith that hopes. There it is. There it is. A faith that hopes. Thank you, Bishop. Y'all praying for me because y'all know I was up late. You know, y'all know this mind, this mind, let this mind be in you, mm. which was also in Christ Jesus. Hey, and that was a real prayer right there. I don't know what y'all talking about. Hallelujah. And so when we talk, when we talk about hope, somebody shout hope. hope. We're talking about a faith that hopes, a faith hopes. And we're going to talk about the importance of why you and I must have the type of folk hope that is described in these passages of scripture. But before I do that, I got to commend each and every one of you all that's here. Every single person that is in this place, I must tell you that there is an immense truth that you may or may not be aware of. Number one, you're talented. You're gifted. You're special. You have abilities. You have skills. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. I know that just because you walked in the building. I can look at you and say that person's got skills. That person has talent. That person has competence. That person has intelligence. That person has abilities. That person has potential. That person has possibilities. All that are within your reach. There are things you can do, whether you know it or not, with enough discipline, you can do them. Hallelujah. But what many of us lack is the hope to endure the inevitable obstacles and struggles that will impede our path. For many of us, this has caused us to change course to an alternate path when the journey becomes too long or we quit when the task seems to be unmanageable or unbeatable. The only thing with either of these choices is that each time we exercise them, they become easier to employ with newer circumstances that are simply fresher manifestations of an old, unburied, conquered challenge. What are you saying, Pastor? Hallelujah. Very simply, I'm saying this. The more you quit, the easier it becomes. Hallelujah. Many persons you might know, someone that has been married and divorced multiple times, and they'll tell you, the first time, they really tried. The second time, they kind of gave it. The third time, it was like, oh, that's it. I'm done with you, bro. It gets easier to quit when one chooses quitting as an option. It becomes easier to throw in the towel when one under the pressure of the moment decides to take an alternate path. Now, here's the other thing that can happen. Many times, we can select a journey and say, this is what I desire. But in the middle of that journey, you say, wow, I didn't know that this was tied to it. Let me readjust my goal so that it becomes something that's a little bit easier for me to attain. And here's the problem with that. And I say this even for my young people who are having a desire to change your major because it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. It's called your assignment. If you can do your assignment, and it's easy, then it doesn't require faith in God. But the thing that makes you pray, that makes you cry, that makes you call on the name of Jesus while you're doing it, that's a sign that that's what I'm supposed to be doing in him. But many times, we want the thing that we can do in our own strength. And the thing I can do in my own strength, what do I need God for? So, I personally believe that God has given me an assignment to inspire and encourage others specifically in hope. I believe in the importance of always believing that things can turn around instantly. I believe in having just a sense of this, this consistent sense and, and being determined enough that every day you wake up, you say that this is the day that I'm planning to point to and say things just got better. I believe that this is the very thing because many of us, this is the thing that makes us say that no matter how much the storm may rage and the wind may blow, the sun will shine 
again. I believe that many of us, it's those of us that are able to say the thing that says in me that even when there are dark clouds in my life, behind all those dark clouds, if I go up high enough, there's a big boy burning, burning, shining ball of light we call the sun. Hallelujah. And it will brighten my day eventually. Y'all know what I'm talking about. People that just have, that, that's how I believe. I, it's stuff I, I wake up and I'm like, this is the day it's going to turn around. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Today. Hallelujah. This is when they're going to stop acting silly on my job today. I, I say, this is the day. This is the day they all start acting right. I, I, I go in every day <laughs> believing that this, the day they going to get it and they think it's gone. This the day. Hallelujah. And I wake up every day with that possibility, hoping. Oh, Lord, you know. Hallelujah. And, and to be sure, hope of which I've just described, that's in a, that is an essential quality needed for any human being. And one of the most notable advocates for not just civil rights, but for human rights and the dignity of all people, Dr. Martin Luther King, here's what he said. He said that everything done in the world is done by hope. And, and, and so the optimism that many of us have learned to embrace with our positive affirmations of how strong we are, how beautiful we are, it has resulted in many of us meeting goals, but we aren't any more satisfied. You are like that sister girl on the help. I was kind. Come on, come on. Nobody, okay, I'm not going to, y'all don't want to act like y'all don't know it. All right. I was kind. Y'all do know it. Okay, y'all act like y'all don't go to the movies around here. I know y'all watch stuff. Hallelujah. And so, there's a word that's called self-efficacy. Self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the belief that over time, I can overcome any situation. So there's positive affirmations. If I keep saying I'm strong, I keep saying I'm beautiful, I'll convince myself that I'm those things. And then there's a sense of self-efficacy. That if you give me enough time, eventually within myself, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to overcome this challenge. I'm going to beat down this obstacle. I'm going to overwhelm this difficulty. But this is not the type of hope that God desires to operate within the believer. What do you mean by that? Because the hope that God desires for a believer, it's not about self-improvement. It's not about self-enhancement, not about self-achievement, not about self-preservation, and not about self-promotion. And how do we know that? It's tied right to the verses that we just read. See, these verses are tied to the previous verses. That was deep, wasn't it? See, they're tied to the previous verses. And what do we say? Last week, the writer intends to do what? To exhort the believers by encouraging them to press towards a mature knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's saying, listen, I understand how culture was used to usher you into your relationship with Christ, but go on. Leave those things behind and go on to maturity. I know you got saved because you had a sense of identity connected to your, to your community. I got it. But now go on to knowledge of Jesus. Hallelujah. I know you got saved because they told you that if you had faith, you could become a millionaire. Hallelujah. But now that you say, go on to maturity. Thank you, Jesus. I know some of us got saved because you, but you heard that he's a healer and he can heal your physical body and he can do that. But now it's time to go on. To maturity, going on to knowing the person and nature and work of Jesus Christ. That, that's what we talked about last week, going on, going on. And then he said, go on, because here's why. He warns them that if they don't go on and endure, they can ultimately drift away from God and be lost. If you don't keep going, you might be lost. Or it might be a sign or indication that you never really were saved. And so many of us, we haven't really been exposed type of Christian love. And we don't really totally get this whole thing about the truth of Scripture and specifically how God calls us to administer it gracefully. And so why do I say that? Because I believe in, 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 in being sensitive to how things can impact others emotionally. But we can't allow the possibility of someone's response to control God's message. 
Hallelujah. Many people say, I don't want to hurt them. So they change and adjust and alter the message. And the person never really hears from God. They hear, they really just hearing from you and your warped sense of sensitivity. Thank you, Jesus. And so I believe then in being sensitive again to how things can impact others. And so believers, though, should administer truth like a master surgeon. Somebody say master surgeon. See, when a master surgeon is trying to take out your appendix, I've had my, my appendix taken out. He didn't cut open my chest. Okay, maybe you went to the wrong hospital. The, a master surgeon only cuts enough. Hallelujah. Why? Because the ailment that's within is worth incising upon you. It's worth hurting you to remove that ailment because if allowed to remain, it will lead to uncertain causes or possibly death. And so a surgeon cuts you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But an enemy multiplies kisses. Now I'm saying when we administer truth, it's to be done gracefully like a master surgeon. Why? Because many persons are so reckless with truth. The person needs their appendix taken out, not their lungs removed. And so they bring truth, and they're using not a surgical knife, but they're using a machete. And here's the thing. You successfully administered truth, but the patient died. That ain't God. Hallelujah. And so God wants us to have tact when we are administering truth. And you might be saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? It's right there in verse 9. Did you see it? It's right there. Did you, did you see the tact? Y'all know we're a Bible believing study at church. Did you see it? Man, I'm telling you, it's right there. Look at it. It's the second word. Man, I knew y'all saw it. Verse 9 says, but for love. Well, praise the Lord. I do believe that today's message has been a blessing to you. And I'd like to take this time to encourage you with a few final thoughts. When we consider the words specifically of Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, there's something neatly tucked in there particularly that really stands out. And it says simply showing the same diligence unto the full assurance of hope. Which simply means that the, the writer of this particular letter says, hey, there's a level of enthusiasm, a level of excitement that you've already embraced and you continually display in particular how you love God and the name of God and how you serve others. But what he's also encouraging the believers to do is to develop that same level of enthusiasm as it relates to having faith in God. You and I have to develop a sophisticated ear that becomes excited and enthusiastic about hearing the word of God. And that's what's going to cause you and I to develop a faith that has hope. And we're not just talking about simply the hope that our situation can be better, not just the hope that today things can turn around and to be sure for a believer, that is absolutely true. But the greater hope that you and I have is the hope of eternal life. It's the eternal hope that you and I have that Christ died to give us. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter eight, it simply says, whatever hope that can be seen, what does a man yet hope for? So the reason why you and I have a greater hope beyond things just getting better in the moment is the fact that we have a secure eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. And that eternal hope in him, it gives us a present assurance. It gives us the ability to fight with the level of tenacity that no, no obstacle no challenge, no tribulation can prevent us from ever having the ultimate hope that Jesus Christ is going to deliver us. So I encourage you in this, embrace that eternal hope. Hold fast to Jesus Christ and allow that to be what fuels your fight of faith and keeps you in moments of challenge and difficulty. 
I'd also like to encourage you, if you don't have a church home, to come out and worship with us. We enjoy fellowshipping with all of God's people and lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. We're located in the season at the Charles Drew Elementary School that's right off of 50 Pomona Street in the city of San Francisco. Again, that's the Charles Drew Elementary School at 50 Pomona Street, right off of 3rd Street in the city of San Francisco. And if you like, you could visit us on our website. It's www.scfsm.org. Again, that's www.scfsm.org. There's a number of clips and other ways in which you can connect with us, whether that's Facebook, Instagram. Come on, you know all the things. There's a number of ways you can connect with us. So come on, we want to hear from you. Send us a message. We want to hear from you. And, and just, you know, if you need prayer, do so. We, we just want to hear from those that are watching our program. And finally, in this, be encouraged. The Bible simply says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Bible says that it, we are to have the same diligence unto the full assurance of hope. Knowing this, that God wants you to have a mature hope that's not able to be finished or weakened by anything that you ever go through. So be encouraged. God loves you. God is strengthening you in every part of your journey. We love you and see you next time. Thank you. But verse 9, but beloved. Man, that's like a pastor. He says, but beloved, hallelujah, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. And so our hope in Christ is different than what the world offers in that it liberates us from us. Hallelujah. The hope in the world is about you or me. But the hope in Christ, it liberates me from me. How do I know that? See, I know y'all. See, y'all good. I love y'all. Y'all keep asking them questions. Hallelujah. Here's why. Because the verses that we've read have to be understood within the context of the relationship to each other. The word of particularity that stands out to us is the word that we must understand what it is particularly there for. And that word is that. That. We're Bible. Come on, Bible. Study. Come on, Bible. Come on, Bible. Look at somebody. If this your underlining, I don't write in my Bible, but I know y'all do. If this your underlining, highlighting Bible, highlight where you see that in verses 9 and 12. Highlight that. I like that. Y'all moving slow. Verse 10. <laughs> For God is not unrighteous. I'm going to help you. To forget your work and labor of love, which he have showed toward his name in that. He have ministered to the saints and do minister. Y'all see it? Okay. So here's what he says. Your love of God is evident and obvious in how you serve. These believers are being, are being commended for the love of God that lives within them and is evident by their willingness to serve other believers. Here's the amazing thing. They got liberated from themselves so that they could serve other people. And look what he's doing. He's commending them. He's saying, look, with all the stuff you're going through, with all the trials, the tribulations, beloved, I'm persuaded of better things. Why? Because I see how you love the name of God and how you serve other people.